Good afternoon and welcome to the second of the BDI's Future Forward Talks. Today we're going to be discussing an issue that I think affects all of us across Europe and across the world, in fact, which is digitization. And we're very fortunate to have the president of Estonia, Kersti Kaljulait, who's somebody who has lived digitization in a way that uh, most people would aspire to do, which is also true of her country, Estonia. I'm also joined by Iris Plöger, who is a member of the executive board of the BDI, the German Federation of Industries, who also oversees the digitization department as well as health and innovation at the BDI. I think we would like to jump right into our discussion here, but I would also like to give people at home or at the office, wherever you are, the opportunity to ask questions um, via social media, and we will be turning to those questions throughout the discussion to sort of liven up, liven up the talk. My name, by the way, is Matthew Karnichnik. I'm the Chief Europe Correspondent for Politico and have the honor to moderate today's discussion. Madam President, thank you very much for being with us today. As I said, I think your country's reputation speaks for itself when it comes to the progress that it has made in terms of, of e-government. It is really a, a trailblazer uh, in this area. So I, I think we don't need to spend too much time focusing on the particulars of that. And maybe we could look at how Estonia's preparedness in, in this regard has helped it during the COVID crisis, which is obviously something that has affected affected us all. Yes, I, I will just mention one element. Uh, I think it's telling enough. When the crisis started, the Estonian government took a decision that each and every Estonian citizen can now go into e-health system and start their sick leave themselves. Their doctor will later call and validate, ask about the symptoms, etc. But the patient is in no way to go to the uh, office of the doctor risking contaminating the offices and, and, and infecting other people. They are able to start their sick leave all by themselves. I think it saved us uh, quite a lot of, uh, of virus uh, development in Estonia. And we could take this decision in two hours and implement in one day because of course each and every Estonian anyway checks into the e-health system when they want to see the results of their analysis, etc. Also, now, when you had to do the COVID test, let's say you started your sick leave, you informed your doctor, your doctor asked you about your symptoms, and, and then said to you where you can go to the drive-in test place, where also all the necessary precautions were taken not to infect other people while you are testing. And the result of this test, as soon as it appeared from the laboratory, was available for you on eHealth under a red button, which said your COVID test result. And, and, and this way, we felt that our state is not pushing us home into isolation. Uh, I mean, leaving these risks and these fears alone, but we felt always very much supported by the government infrastructure, while we were also personally facing the risks that I may have been infected. Of course, even during the highest level of infections in Estonia, 95% uh, of the people who were sent to test did not have COVID but 5% did, and, and, uh, and we were able to make sure that none of these people went to the doctor's office unless they really needed to finally go to the hospital. And also this meant that there was no clogging in the system, as we now know, we didn't then. This disease, it's very important that you have the diagnosis. It's so important because, I mean, it, it, it only develops slowly. And when it develops, then the, I mean, the risk of death suddenly rises at the sec end of second week. And if you have clogs in the system uh, about diagnosis, or if you have many people unsure whether they really have COVID, then, I mean, it will actually frustrate your, uh, your uh, effort to uh, use the full capacity of your healthcare system to make sure that no lives are lost due to the, I mean, bottleneck between people and the healthcare system. And the, the technological infrastructure held up. I think the you know, fear in a lot of countries would be that it, you know, the, the government websites would be overrun with people trying to... No, no absolutely it. not, because I mean, if you, if you think you did, did daily maybe 2,000 COVID tests, 
I'm sure there are much more people who daily, in a normal day, do some kind of tests or want to check their, uh, their uh, X-ray picture or want to see, I mean, whether their doctor has already, I mean, written out, I mean, their, their disease story or simply want to see how much government has spent on their personal health care in this year. So these queries are much more, much higher in their numbers. So definitely COVID didn't cause any, any congestion in healthcare infrastructure. It did cause some in e-education system because we do have an e-education system, but normally it's a support system. Now it suddenly became the main system. And there we had to quickly raise the capacity indeed, but not in e-health. And, and can you give us a picture of where the uh, pandemic is now in Estonia? How is the infection rate? How is the country doing overall? Uh, active, active number, which we calculate uh, during the last 14 days, the tests which have been done and been positive is uh, around 10, I think slightly lower already today. Okay. Uh, so it's, I mean, it's not there anymore. But what I want to say is very often Nordic countries and, and, uh, and some others, uh, it, we think we managed this pandemic somehow well. I think we were very lucky that it didn't start in Europe, in our countries. We have an island in Estonia, Saarema, the biggest island of Estonia, where the disease could spread, like in Italy. They didn't know it's already in the, in the community for a week. And this did uh, quite a lot of damage. The infection rates on this island were uh, higher than in Bergamo. So uh, luckily, it was a small, isolated place in Estonia. So I think we actually cannot say that we managed better, somebody else managed worse. So we need to understand that those who got the first wave of infection, they couldn't prepare better and we could learn already from their experience, and that explains also our good results. Indeed. Uh, Iris Plöger, one of the surprising things maybe that we've seen in Europe uh, with the outbreak of coronavirus has been a sort of uh, retracting into a shell in some countries, putting national interests ahead of European interests. You've seen this with the suspension of Schengen, which has now been reversed again in most places. As Germany takes over the European presidency, which is going to happen tomorrow on July 1st, what do you think uh, your country can do to promote more cooperation between particularly larger and smaller states, and in particular in the area of innovation? Well, you're absolutely right. We, we suffered, a, we had a lack of solidarity at the beginning of the crisis, which is, I guess, just human and, and natural when you saw all the pictures and when you saw the hotspots in, in Italy, Spain, and France. But I think immediately everyone realized that this is a huge deficit and that we have to work on this solidarity within Europe. So I guess that is one of the major tasks that Germany has in its EU Council um, presidency to, to work on this solidarity. Everyone is aware that we, we have to stand together and that we have to fix the problems and that's not only a recovery plan and all the money we have to get into place and to, to find a consensus on that, but also to work on, on future tasks we have, uh, especially on innovation. We, we touched that topic before. Um, there's a, the great fear that people will um, s make savings on the, uh, the cut downs, cost, cost cut downs at the, at the wrong end, which means innovation. And I think we have to foster even more innovation than we had before. We did, we already had some structural problems before the crisis. So of course that hits us now after Corona. And to rebuild uh, Europe, we have to really work on innovation and, and digitalization. And of course sustainability is a huge issue there. So um, that's, that, that is, I think, the major task. Of course, we had everything already put in, set in place for the presidency before we had corona, and now the government had to, and then the whole Europe had to uh, restart the, the process and, and make probably new alliance. And of course, some other thing we, we haven't touched yet is, is the huge challenge of, of Brexit. So we, we have to work on new majorities in, in Europe. We have to work on new alliance, and we need the big partners uh, in the same way as we need the little ones. Uh, so we've seen um, President Macron and Chancellor Merkel yesterday uh, giving a strong sign to the European Union. And of course, we, we need these old alliance, the French, German industry, but we need alliance all over Europe. And it's, I guess, a parallel to the, to the startup scene 
you can see all over Europe that uh, the incumbents, the, the huge industry companies, that they work closely together with startups because they know that they can only trigger innovation by working together closely. And so I think we have to see it the same way all over Europe. So the little country, the smaller countries with a high expertise, for example, in digitization, uh, work together closely with, with the industry parts. Madam President, what, what do you think about, about these ideas? Your, your country is obviously one that relies very heavily on startups. You visited a small uh, Estonian startup uh, here in Berlin yesterday that has designed electric bikes. Do you think that the larger European countries are listening enough to the uh, smaller, you know, possibly more, more nimble countries? You visited your, your counterpart, President Steinmeier, yesterday. Um, what, what, are you, what are you telling him and others here in this regard? Well, uh, also Sunday I visited a, a company called Skeleton who has set up a shop here in Germany, similarly like Ampler Bikes, and they are uh, producing super condensators. And they say Germany is like a battery. It has high capacity but loads slowly. Estonia is like a super condensator. loads up quickly and empties itself quickly as well. But we actually can work very well together to have the best, uh, best solutions. And no, I don't think that uh, that European startup sector should somehow be particularly more supported uh, uh, from MFF and and the and the EU support packages. Yes, Horizon 2020 should be strong, and I hope it wouldn't suffer uh, too much uh, from our attention on the on the uh, on the uh, current and pressing issues of of COVID-19 and that somebody would stand up for the uh, best part of the EU budget also in the council meetings, but it normally doesn't have an owner there because, I mean, it's geographically neutral, uh, neutral and uh, entirely merit-based part of the budget, my favorite part of the budget, and we need this to make sure that innovation in Europe uh, continues to develop. The other part of uh, innovation which is very important and ma far more important than, than money is regulation, that we should make sure that uh, in all sectors, all technologies and, and startups can, can compete. And that means for states a little bit also this hands-off approach. You need and choose which technologies are most prospective, which technologies will develop quicker. You should leave space for market. You should set your objective, your aims and regulation on what you want to achieve and then let the market to do the rest. And this is a big risk now that with all the public money in the system, we forget that the main driver in innovation is the adaptation of economy to the regulation which we are able to create. And very often I feel that European Union tries to monetize all of its policy, but I don't think it should. I think it should, uh, it should uh, stick to the regulation which should be enabling, which should be enabling the development. One of my favorites is the artificial intelligence regulation. In artificial intelligence we should uh, clearly make sure that our uh, AI systems can learn from the data we produce in a safe way, safe way for each and every one of us as well as in individuals. Uh, and for that we need to again regulate for all sectors, for all technologies, the objective, not the pathways, technological pathways, because our legal cycle is longer than technological cycle today is. It's not like 100 years ago we could develop gradually the traffic code which will now fit the German autobahn we are in a very different situation. So I think that we should not concentrate too much on money. As we know, EU budget is 1% of the EU GDP. If you add the European Investment Bank, uh, you can come to 2% maybe, but not much more. And, and therefore, regulation, permissive legal environment for new, new technologies is the most important element of EU, which I see in uh, coming out of this crisis. Well, Iris Brugge, regulation is something that often makes people in the business world uh, quite nervous. Uh, as we sort of uh, follow the, the advent of these new technologies, especially around artificial intelligence, what role do you think the regulators should be playing, especially at the European level? Because so often in Europe you've had a situation where it's the national authorities who are the first to regulate and then you end up with a patchwork across 27 countries. Um, he should be a wise regulator for sure. So we always like to talk about smart regulation and sometimes I fear that we uh, rather than spend time on implementing new technologies, we immediately think of regulating technologies, especially Germany is uh, ahead of that and, and talking about um, whether you have one uh, uniform 
regulation, that for sure is very, very important. That's, I think, one of the um, great advantages of the GDPR, that we have one regulation in place. So we see that it's still practiced in different ways all over Europe, so we have to harmonize that. Um, but uh, regulation, for sure, I think you, as a trust-building measurement, you need some regulation probably in the end, but you really have to have a close look how much regulation is already in place. And it's not that we are you know, out of space and there's no regulation. We, we had this, being a lawyer myself, we had this discussions for a year now that when we started with digitalization, everyone was saying everything is new now and we need a lot of new regulation, which is not true because the existing regulation still fits for most of the cases. And you really have to have a close look where you feel new regulation has to be put in place. Um, for example, with uh, artificial intelligence, there's always this example of facial recognition where people say there's a lot of harm you can do with a facial recognition. So we really have to see where it's not that AI as a technology uh, does any harm. It can be, you know, do a lot of benefits in one place, but it can be difficult in another situation and context. So we really have to look at the context and see where regulation is needed, but we shouldn't start right away with regulation. We should rather start with, with implementing AI. That is what we feel that uh, as not, not, only reluctant, not only SME, but, but also other people are reluctant of using AI because they believe that it will do harm to them and they do not use the low-hanging fruits that are already in place. Artificial intelligence is not something new. I mean, it has been there for 50, I think even 70 years. It just uh, it's come to the mind of the people because now all this data is available and so they're, therefore they're afraid that, that, that AI will take control over their life. Exactly. I think the, the point of data is always at the core of all of these discussions, people's personal data, industrial data, the sharing of data, how this data should flow between the state and the private sector and, and the research sector. In Estonia, these issues seem to be less controversial, uh, I would say, than in a place like Germany and in, in much of the rest of, of Europe. Um, wh wh why is that and, and what, what can other Europeans learn from, from your experience uh, in this area? Uh, first of all, I, I, I partially agree with you that it's time to start implementing AI, but not because I don't think the regulation is necessary, but because I think as well we do have already GDPR and this helps already quite a lot. And, and for the quite a big part of uh, technology applications, you should simply think how your analog law applies in digital sphere. And, and, uh, and there is lots and uh, lots of uh, academic analysis around, particularly, of course, in cyber defense uh, area, but also other areas which, uh, which shows that uh, current legal base can be used in order to, uh, to uh, also apply in the digital sphere. But I also partially disagree because, um, I mean, in Estonia, we didn't launch ourselves into e-government environment creation without protective and permissive legal environment. Indeed, it's very simple. It basically says data belongs to people, not to government. It says also government cannot create a big database and, and there, there cannot be anybody else than a person themselves who is able from the systems to aggregate all data concerning them. It also says that if somebody looks at the data in the databases, then, I mean, people will be notified. So that if somebody looks at my address, or, I mean, we get calls in the president's office when we have been looking at the address database for somebody's addresses to invite people to the party, for example. They can call and query, why did you look? And we have to answer, it's an obligation. So uh, many people, thought that Estonia is a kind of wild west of digital development. It isn't. It is a smartly regulated environment which protects people, businesses, data. And we also need to upgrade it because, you know, e-government 2.0 is getting proactive. Our people are now asking for proactivity from the system. What does it mean? It means that if uh, in Estonian system today, if you, for example, are eligible for social support, let's say universal child support, you have to apply in the e-system, e-government system, you have to apply. And people are asking, I mean, you know, you know I had a baby, you know my uh, bank account because I pay your taxes and you know I have the right to this support. Why on earth do I have to go online and uh, check some boxes, I mean? I shouldn't be able to do, do it. You, you should simply pay out to me. 
And we have a few services in place who do this exactly. Like a retired person living alone is entitled to a top of a, a top up of a pension. Now, this person doesn't even have to know if this service exists. Two systems compare the data and pay out, which is all fine and dandy. But the problem is, this is only when you pay people money. Can you, for example, gather data about somebody to find out that they are not in employment, they are young, they have stopped their education, and send a social worker behind their door? I mean, there is no material difference between the two services. But I mean, it's a proactive action by the state, which by the current, uh, let's say, common agreement, you cannot do in Estonia. In the future, can we or can't I? This is a debate we need to have, where the proactive state is taking us. But above all, we want the guiding principles. We don't want to kind of go and regulate technology piece by piece. And I think here I totally agree with you. And we have good examples. We in Europe tend to think we are very, I mean, not so developed digitally and technologically like US. But in GovTech, we are much better, uh, much better developed. And the precise reason is that we do think of issues which led us to GDPR. And we are protected by GDPR. For example, in San Francisco, all places, some facial recognition technology was forbidden. In Europe, we don't forbid. We analyze these cases against GDPR, and then they can go forward. So actually, I think we should get out of our, our, our thinking rut that we are, we are not as developed digitally. Our legal space is much more permissive for, uh, for GovTech than uh, it is elsewhere, and we are much more ready to actually make use of this. Now, when the virus has demonstrated to us that the state needs to be present for the people, even when people cannot present themselves to offices. Uh, Iris Pröge, one of the big differences here when we're talking about Estonia and, and Germany, say, or many other European countries, is size. Clearly, trust is very important in these debates about data and so forth, and I, I think the BDI and others are, are in the middle of these uh, debates. But what, what do you think is the crucial factor in convincing the, the broader public and also the, the private sector to embrace uh, these, these technologies going forward? Well, first of all, I would like to say that I totally agree that we need uh, data sovereignty and uh, digital sovereignty, however you name it. Uh, I think we come from a system and that's the basis of the GDPR to, to have a principle of data poorness. And that is because and from history, it was always a def uh, defense right against the state. And especially in, in the German debate uh, in the last 10 years or 20, you could always tell there was always a fear that the state would have a closer look at, at your personal data. I feel that Estonia might be a little bit more open-minded to see the the advantages of such a public system that there's not such a mistrust. We actually... No, 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 I'm sorry to interrupt, but I mean, this is very important. No, our state has promised to our people, and it's a legal text. We don't look unless you ask us to look. And that's the basis of the trust, not some kind of etheric, just Estonians being a small nation and more... No, 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 no. We, it, is, it is a law. It is a law. It's a legal space which makes this trust to happen. That's so important. That's the most important element. Sorry to interrupt. Okay. But, but anyway, we, we just recently saw that in Germany was a corona warning app that we had a broad discussion on, on personal data and how we can use it or do not use it. But anyway, it's not all about personal data, even though we have a strong focus on that. It's, of course, also about the industrial data, the B2B data, and that is, of course, one of our major concerns as, as BDI. And we really see that we need more incentives throughout U Europe to have data sharing. Because, as you said, I mean, AI technologies, they need data. They need tons of data. And sometimes, it's not, I, I always have this picture of, of Scroogey McDuck, who is sitting on the pile of data, and he does it like he was sitting on a pile of, of money, and he didn't know what to make with all the money. I sometimes feel we, we are aware we have a lot of industrial data within Europe, but we have to learn to make good use out of it. So it's not always only a question of access to data. I think we, we can have facilitate that more, but it's rather a question of having the right competences to use the data. And there we are just at the beginning of the whole procedure. So we really, really have to work on our skills to, to, to learn how to use data. And I think then the data sharing will come from itself. But we always mix up the discussion between the personal data and the industrial data. And they are really two, two different types. 
and um, we, we need all the, coming from industrial bases in, in Germany, we know we will only be successful if we build on these competences we have in the analog world, so this is an, our industrial experience, and we have to combine that with, with AI technology. So um, the, the, there's a strong connection between two, these two things, and therefore we really welcome that the Euro European Commission has introduced a data strategy and that we had a broad consultation on that, so hopefully we'll see some progress on that, even though we have to suffer and cope with the crisis, the corona crisis. Well, and as, as a result of the crisis, as you've both indicated, there's been a lot of discussion in Europe about digital sovereignty, a lot of um, people pushing for more autonomy for European uh, digital industry. But given all of these challenges, some of which you know we've just discussed, the importance of data, the centrality of data, and, and the hurdles for many companies to tap into that data, uh, Madam President, is it really realistic to think that uh, Europe will be able to challenge the companies out of the United States and increasingly out of uh, China in, in this sphere? I don't know whether our companies need to challenge, but we are already providing a better legal space for all technology development. Let's take ADAS. I mean, uh, what do you see in, uh, in some other parts of the world, these company being, companies being called to the parliament to explain why they are allowing anonymity and nicknames and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and this kind of developments on their platforms? Well, in Europe, we don't blame the companies for not doing government's job because identity is government business. And we have realized in Europe that digital identity is as normal as an analog identity, which we normally call passport. It's just a little bit safer because, because it normally is a physical token with some passcodes, whereas passport is just a piece of paper. But nevertheless, we've recognized that it is our, the government's obligation to give out and protect identities in digital sphere. You cannot blame Apple or Google for not doing it because they don't command legal space. We command legal space. And I'm quite sure that when ADAS is really available in all European countries and has a considerable penetration rate among European citizens who are more and more actively using their digital IDs, you will also use uh, your Apple and Amazon services through your digital ID. This way we have driven anonymity out of the internet. So here we are actually complementing the drive of the big companies with something which only Europe in the world is offering. Similarly, I think many people now know what is ADAS. And I, I'm sure ADAS wouldn't exist if Estonia for 20 years would not have already had digital identity from which others could learn. Now the next big thing is indeed Gaia, the European cloud. Cloud, well, people have been very wary about using cloud because the question is, if it's not on my computer, then on whom, whose computer this really is? And again, uh, Estonian company Guard Time, and I'm quite sure many of its competitors global, uh, globally and in Europe are uh, creating and proposing the ways and means to make sure that also in the cloud your data is protected. And again, it's only Europe, the biggest and richest market globally, who is thinking of a unified approach of this kind of data management. So I honestly cannot see how you can call Europe uh, as being backwards in digital matters. It isn't. What do you, what do you think about that, Iris Prüger? Could Europe succeed by becoming a kind of regulatory um, you know, haven as being ahead of all of the other uh, countries in terms of its regulation on, on these issues? Well, I think even President, President Trump just said that we are good at regulating, so maybe he's right. What something, a learning we had, I think, in, in the COVID crisis is that we, that Europe is, is really a place uh, of longing, that people want to be there, and, and after all, I mean, we, we manage we, the crisis quite well, I would say, and, and if we stand together, um, this is a, a place where people want to live, and, and we, we feel there's a lot of attraction from all over the world. We, we can see there's an increasing trade conflict, that there are um, some more radical powers in other places in the world, and that we have a huge consensus of democratic systems within Europe, and we can build on that. And we have a long experience on regulation, and uh, we are a safe place, and uh, we have competences, for example, um, looking, you mentioned cybersecurity, 
and, and other things. Uh, so we have really strong capabilities there so we can use. And, and you also mentioned Gaia-X. That for sure is a really interesting project that was uh, originated coming from, from Germany, France, and to build on a, on a network of cloud systems because we learned it's never good to, to make a copy-paste of the system you've seen somewhere else in the world, especially not in digital times, you, because you will always be way too slow. So there's, it doesn't make sense to build another hyperscaler while there are already hyperscalers in, in, in place for, for 10 years and we have much more experience. So we always have to find our European way of handling things, which is kind of a grassroot initiative, I would say. And, and uh, Gaia-X is a network of clouds could be a great example for that. We have really have to find our, let's say, the third way of how to deal with things. We see that, that, that there are other areas in the world where they're really, really fast and having all these technologies, that they're really open-minded and that they're open for, for, for innovation, for fast innovation. Sometimes, I guess, we're a little too slow. We have to take up speed with some of these things, but we do it our own way, and let's see, it's, it's kind of a systemic competition through regions, uh, by regions in the world, and we'll see who will, you know, be better off at the end. So we just be, I guess, a little bit more self-confident in what we can do, and we really have to strengthen our strengths, I would say, and, and try to find the, the sweet spots, the weak spots, and, and to work on that. But it, it's never the solution or the logic to say we are against other things, but we should rather spend more time on what we can build up ourselves to be a little bit more independent and to maybe have a choice in the end. That is, all, that is it all about. Madam President, for, for all of the, the promise of digital technologies and all of the advances and um, you know, benefits that it brings to all of us, there, there are also risks, there are dangers. Your country experienced this in, in 2007 with the uh, cyber attack by Russia, which really was a wake-up call, I think, not only for your own uh, country, but uh, for the entire continent and beyond. Do, do you think that uh, Europe in general is paying enough attention to the risks of um, cyber attacks and the kind of dedication that some countries around the world uh, have to use these tools to disrupt, in particular, um, European uh, countries and democracy? Yeah, the cyber attack in 2007 was a simple denial of the service attack. Each and every banking system, I mean, enjoys this kind of attacks daily and more than one, I'm sure, nowadays. And we all know how to fight it back. And we were not unprepared. Even then, we sealed off our e-governance model. You couldn't access it uh, from abroad, but at, at home it was functional. So we were not unprepared. The rest of the world probably was. We were the only country who could have been attacked in, uh, in this way at that point of time. And a lot of good it did to all of us. So we resulted uh, in creation of the NATO Cybersecurity Center of Excellence in Tallinn, which has done a lot of work in rising awareness and also uh, rising uh, our understanding based on academic analysis how our analog law applies in, in, the, uh, in the cyberspace. And uh, from 2007, this takes me to early March this year, where Estonia, supported uh, also by, by uh, our partners and allies in United Nations Security Council, First time ever, would you believe, this year in March, uh, uh, took up a cyber attack against Georgia and it was attributed to, to Russia in this, uh, in this discussion and any other business in United Nations Security Council. First ever, can you imagine? No, only. And, and this is actually, uh, I believe, the, uh, well, the beginning of the end of the conventional cyber problem and its recognition and understanding. We are getting there. We recognize that globally we need a place where we can go and complain when we come under attack by conventional cyber means. And, uh, and we are clarifying also the legal space how we can react. I mean, uh, what's the balance of defense, offense? States are declaring their interest. Estonia has, for example, done so as well how they uh, intend to apply the analog law in, in such a case. All this is done. But, I mean, now we are much more threatened by the hybrid risks in the cybersphere, not attacks against systems, but attacks against minds. 
And here I don't see so clear cut road to the solution as I see for the for the systems. For the systems it's very much You mean through disinformation, fake news. Exactly. For systems it's very easy. Technology and cyber hygiene. I mean people need to keep good cyber hygiene and technology can do the rest. The fight for mines is much more difficult and I don't see a roadmap how we can uh, resolve this uh, quickly and easily. So uh, from the risks of 2007, we have evolved into the world of new risks. But the old risks, uh, risks can easily resurface and I see one danger resulting from this COVID crisis. Many states have set up e-models and e-systems rapidly. They might not be as secure as necessary and your people's cyber hygiene level might not be as high as you need for safe uh, use of these services. So my advice for everybody is, go slowly, apply the same model for all services, which starts with a single digital identity for both public and private sector use, and then gradually train your people in cyber hygiene by simpler services, like e-school, like registration for schools, applications for social services, and only then move to higher risk services like e-health, e-elections, e-voting, for example. It still takes time and there are still risks, but the new risks compound the old risks. And, and in Estonia, we are not blind. We have felt that dealing with the conventional cyber risks up to the level of Security Council has been our obligation because we promote e-services and e-governance. Iris Plöger, we've also heard a lot of, in recent uh, months and years about state-sponsored industrial espionage, uh, cyber attacks on companies. Do you think that the uh, industrial sector in general and elsewhere in Europe is, is better prepared maybe than some states to deal with these threats? Or is it something where industry also needs to be uh, much more sort of aware of the dangers? I think they are they are aware, but it's an ongoing race. I mean, it's going on and on, and so both sides improve all the time. So uh, I absolutely agree. We need a high standard of, of cybersecurity, and this is also I think we are quite quite doing really well at this technology. We have to implement it. That's what we figured out in the past. Of course, it's all about money. It costs money. But is this something where standard. the state should be more involved, do you think? Or should industry be left to its well, own Well, it, it depends on whether it's official administrative stuff. Then, of course, uh, the, the state is in, in charge. Or whether we talk about industry, then they are in charge themselves. And they don't need the state for that. They, they should be responsible themselves. It's a kind of digital sovereignty that we do not want to see only for the for the people, but of course also for, for enterprises as well as for governments. So everyone has to take over his responsibility. And I totally agree that maybe some people after the COVID crisis would jump into all these digital standards and they might not be that, that secure. Uh, but if you say we may, maybe have to slow down, I don't like to hear that in Germany because I think we've been quite slow with regard to e-government and other issues in the past. So uh, I would like to see, to speed up a little bit and, 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 and maybe to see that some things were possible here in Germany. I mean, you talk about e-school and all the other things. You had already had that in place before. So it was easy for you to switch in the COVID, I mean, there was no real switch in the COVID crisis. While here, we had a lot of discussions in the past when whether we want to use all these tools, uh, whether we are against it. So, but then the COVID let us just jump right into it. So schools had to be doing homeschooling, e-schooling, and, and the governments had to be I more I can tell digital. you from my own experience, it's not working as well it's as it working. should. It's not working. I know it's not working. But uh, if we jump into that discussion, it will take another hour, I guess. But anyway, we at least we had a chance to experience all these digital things. And what we asked for is don't pull back now, but at least, you know, move on, walk down that road, mm -hmm. because you see, it doesn't hurt that much, and we, we can improve, and we can be more digital in daily life, and I think we'll have much higher acceptance within society, because Germany really has lacked of, of digital uh, experience in the past throughout the society. Yeah, but I don't mean slow down, but I mean trot carefully, yeah, and start absolutely. with lower risk, and I speak of experience, because you don't know how often I hear this discussion that e-prescriptions not safe. Why? Well, there are countries which use e-prescription, which is e-mail. I mean, of course it's not safe. Our e-prescription is different. It's based on my digital ID, which I present at the pharmacy, and then they check what the doctor has prescribed and give this out to me, and I even know what the pharmacist was who looked at this e-prescription. But in the normal mind, this is e-prescription. And if this e-mail prescription is not safe, 
the whole idea of e-prescriptions down the drain. Mm -hmm. We vote electronically since 2003, and it's safe, first of all, because if I enter the safe uh, ecosystem of digital identity of Estonia, everything's encrypted, nobody even knows what I'm doing there, voting or just checking whether my, my I don't know, COVID analysis has arrived. And there are numerous other, I mean, levels of protection. But this is all lumped together with voting machines in the United States. E-voting is not safe. That's why I'm worried. If now some of these things backfire, please be able to analyze and understand why it did backfire, not pull back totally. It's very important that uh, we handle this uh, post-crisis rapid development way in a right way, not, I mean, risking too much. Iris Perka, you, you, you mentioned that, that Germany has been sort of forced to embrace digitalization in a lot of spheres because of the COVID crisis. Where do you think it's really taken hold in industry? How has industry really changed as a result of the pandemic? And where is there not going to be any going back to the way things used to be after it's over? Well, it's always difficult to speak for the entire industry because, of course, this is a complex picture. But let's say, of course, industry has been on the road and the digitalization before. I think uh, Industry 4.0 was, was born, was created in Germany, and it's really a landmark uh, throughout the world uh, coming from an industrial basis. Um, but let's put it that way. I think companies who have been on the road before they will probably take up speed now, and they've realized that it's even uh, more important to invest into all the digital infrastructure and, and the skills. And on the other hand, for those who haven't really been into the topic before, of course, the crisis hit them really, really hard. And uh, if you run out of money, if your business, uh, business model is kind of old style and old fashioned, of course, it's a huge investment to go into digitalization. Sometimes it's even a question of generations, whether the next generation will pick up and, 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 and try harder and invest and have a strong focus on, on digital issues. But uh, of course, we expect that not everyone will survive after this crisis, frankly speaking. We're almost out of time, but I did want to ask both of you one more question uh, about Europe and the outlook. As I said, we, we are just at the beginning of the German presidency. Madam President, over the next uh, six months, we're going to experience a, a lot of sort of very important events from the negotiations in Europe over a recovery fund to uh, Brexit being kind of really uh, made permanent, uh, possibly without a, a trading deal. Uh, what, what do you think the, the outlook is for Europe in, in the next uh, year or so as it really tries to cope with this pandemic and all of these sort of forces uh, from the outside and uh, especially from a digital perspective, what, what do you think the, the longer term outlook is for, for the uh, continent as it tries to cope with these challenges? I take a different perspective, not digital, I take climate perspective. And through this perspective, I can really easily explain you why I'm very optimistic about the future of Europe. Look how the whole world is tackling the climate issue. It's, it's organizing climate conferences and it takes time to agree where it takes place and what's on the agenda and then there is no implementing body. In European Union, Yes, it's slow process and we always agree by the lowest common denominator. But we have managed to have an agreement that this biggest, richest market will not allow that uh, there will be a leftover uh, non-internalized cost of, uh, of pollution by 2050. We have this agreement in place and we know how we are going to implement it. Because the system is there. We come together in Brussels. There is a place called Big Egg where we meet. And uh, we have a procedure by which we agree, and then we know how it will be implemented as well. It is slow. People co complain that it's very slow. They're always arguing. They're never agreeing. But it's the best mechanism you can imagine for the continent. Imagine we try to solve migration is uh, issues or climate issues or digital interoperability issues without this set of rules, without the treaty being at the basis of all our debates. Will it really be quicker in Europe? I'm sorry, definitely not. European Union is European unique competitive advantage. However, muddling through it seems to be at the times. Well, thank you very much, uh, Iris Pröger. As the president says, it's never easy to get things done in Europe. Six months sounds like a long time. It really isn't. And 
we all know how these presidencies work. They don't always fulfill their promise. I think that Angela Merkel in particular has made clear that she wants to push forward in a number of key areas. From your perspective, um, from a, a German industrial perspective, what is the one thing you would really like to see this presidency achieve in the next six months? Well, um, I, th I think there are tons of homework to do for, for poor, old, poor government, and I'm glad that Angela Merkel is still in place because she has a lot of experience in, in, in Europe to, to hold things together. But um, the to I, to I totally agree with you that we have to be good at te technologies for, for sectors that are, that are important to us because you can only be good at something that you really care for. And I think questions of climate change is something that is higher on the agenda of the European society. So we should really work on developing the right technologies, find the answers to be ahead of other ones. So see that as also as a competition of technologies. And we, I think we can work on that. And, and also, I think it's, it's a question of, of trust and mindset. So um, we really have to be looking forward to be keen and eager to, to, you know, to create a Europe we all want to live in in, in the future and uh, to, to be good at things we, we can be good at. And, and we touched a lot of topics today. I'm, I'm grateful for that. And uh, so we shouldn't forget about digitalization, sustainability, and all the other issues simply because of the crisis, but we should really understand that this is uh, the chance for us to, to be even better after overcoming the crisis. Well, on that optimistic note, uh, thank you to you both. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Iris Prilge. Thank you for tuning in today, and we are now going to show you a brief film on e-government in Estonia, which we hope you will continue to uh, stay for. Otherwise, we look forward to seeing you again at the next Future Forward talk here at the BDI in Berlin. Thank you.